Beat poet William S. Burroughs is best known for his 1959 novel, Naked Lunch, which has been on and off of various banned books lists since its original publication due to depictions of drug and alcohol use, orgies, violence, pedophilia, child murder, and obscene language. Knowing this, it is no wonder that the impetus for his career as a writer was a direct result of a single, careless, drunken night in Mexico in which he killed his wife, Joan Balmer Burroughs. Hey everyone and welcome back to Dinner Crime here at the Professor's Kitchen. In last week's video we discussed the murder of Shawnee Baraka and her friend Rayshawn Holm. Shawnee was the daughter of controversial poet laureate and self-proclaimed black nationalist Amiri Baraka and his well-respected activist wife Amina Baraka. In that video I mentioned that early in his writing career Amiri Baraka was part of the generation of poets along with his then wife Hetty Cohen Jones and founders of the movement Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. This cast of characters was known for pushing the envelope of what was considered appropriate in literature, language, and society. Baraka had a hand in publishing some of this obscene literature as well as writing quite a bit of it on his own. Arguably though, Burroughs, Ginsburg, and Kerouac went well beyond the typical beat behavior of just insulting the government with their crude words. Not only did they buck the government with their deviant acts and self-harm, they kept thousands of pages of notes on these acts that eventually became published manuscripts, basically confessing to all of their crimes. Their novels and poetry are largely autobiographical depictions of every high and every rock bottom low. But you know what they say about hitting rock bottom. There's nowhere to go but up from there. And so we still discuss and teach these authors because of the heights they reached in creating a signature style of writing, their experimentation with language, and legal precedents they set regarding free expression. In a moment, I will whisk myself into the kitchen to prepare eggs William S. Burroughs. Just a word of warning, this is not one of the better dishes that I prepared, but I will include a link to the full recipe in the description box below, just in case you want to try it yourself. Also, if you notice that I'm doing something wrong, <laughs> then whatever way that I ruined the dish, please let me know in the comment section if you've tried this before or if you've tried a recipe that's similar to it. I don't know what I did wrong, but I'm willing to learn from my mistakes and try to correct it in the future. All right, let's get cooking. William Seward Burroughs II was born on February 5th, 1914 in St. Louis, Missouri to a wealthy family. His paternal grandfather and namesake invented the adding machine. Burroughs was considered a sensitive and imaginative child who was constantly seeking his father's attention and approval. In fact, his love of guns developed out of a desire to prove his manliness and strength to his father. They'd often go out on hunting or shooting trips with groups of men, wading around in swamps and shooting birds. Despite this, Burroughs realized from an early age that he was different than other boys, but did not understand the world enough to officially refer to himself as gay until later in life. While Burroughs' father was strict and unfeeling, his mother was gushing and devoted to her son. She indulged and encouraged him, and was once quoted as saying that she worshipped the ground he walked on. She sheltered him from the world until she couldn't anymore which may have been the reason his friends reported that he had a certain naivete or childishness about him that lasted up until his death. In one documentary about his life, his biographer went so far as to mention that Burroughs believed that babies came out of a woman's navel, even at the age of 22. In spite of his mother's devotion and desire to keep him her baby forever, Burroughs went on to study English literature at Harvard, and graduated from there in 1936. For the next 10 years, Burroughs continued to study semantics and develop his writing style while working various odd jobs in St. Louis, Chicago, and eventually New York. In 1946, he joined the social club that would come to be known as the Beats. His friend Lucien Carr introduced him to the woman who would become his common-law wife, Joan Vollmer. At that time, Valmer rented an apartment in Greenwich Village with her friend Edie Parker. 
Parker later married Jack Kerouac. Arguably, Burroughs' most important and detrimental friendship was with a hustler and junkie named Herbert Hunky. Hunky taught Burroughs how to mug people at gunpoint and how to deal drugs. Burroughs' behavior got progressively worse to the point where he was essentially chased out of New York City for fear of getting busted by police and serving some jail time for his illegal actions. In the first of several escapes from these illegal acts, Burroughs and Vollmer ran off to Texas together. There they bought 99 acres of farmland and attempted to grow marijuana. They never made a profit, but their son, William S. Burroughs III, also known as Billy Burroughs, was born on the farm in 1947. Joan Vollmer was born on February 4, 1924 in Loudonville, New York, to an upper-middle-class family. She graduated from Barnard College with a degree in journalism and went on to marry her first husband, Paul Adams. After finding out that she was pregnant, Vollmer convinced Adams that the baby was his. Most of her friends believed that their daughter, Julie, was actually the product of an affair Vollmer had with a student at Columbia College while Adams was serving in World War II. Adams and Vollmer divorced in 1944, and Vollmer became a single mother to little Julie. According to all reports, Vollmer was a brilliant woman who was an intellectual match to all the men in the Beat generation, as well as their muse. Undoubtedly, her downfall was her immediate and unceasing obsession with Burroughs, as well as her addictions to drugs and alcohol. The combination of these two things led Burroughs and Vollmer to run from New York to Texas to Louisiana and finally to Mexico. They were constantly running from their problems, chasing opportunities to abuse more drugs and commit more crimes. Their adventures were funded in part by Burroughs' parents, who provided him with a $200 per month allowance and often bought homes and investment properties for them when they moved. When the couple and their two children moved to New Orleans, Burroughs' mom and dad decided to pay them a little visit. His parents didn't exactly approve of the house, nor the neighborhood in which Vollmer and Burroughs were living. So they bought them a different house in another area, along with a couple of investment properties. However, it wasn't long before the couple had made themselves known to the police and were yet again on the run, this time to Mexico. After police in Louisiana raided their home in 1949, the family moved to Mexico City to avoid drug and illegal weapons charges. In Mexico, drugs were easily accessible and authorities could be paid to look the other way. Burroughs was also free to seek the company of young men who could be paid in food, drugs, alcohol, housing, or cash to fulfill his homosexual desires. Vollmer kept herself occupied by caring for the children and drinking tequila from 8 a.m. until she went to bed at night. Also during that time, she exchanged letters with and entertained friends such as Allen Ginsberg and other members of their social group. One friend noted that he ran into her in the street during her final days and said, quote, She looks so awful. Joan was almost a beauty. She carried herself a little awkwardly, swinging one arm more than the other. She had an incurable blood disease. She had open running sores and knew she was dying. She was thin-haired, had lost some of her hair. I'm not going to make it, she said. Still, she refused her friend's invitation to return to New York with them. She refused to leave Burroughs. In the two months prior to his wife's death, Burroughs wandered off to Ecuador in search of a drug called Yage with a 21-year-old college student named Adelbert Lewis Marker. The two had an arrangement regarding sex where Marker agreed to twice a week sexual encounters with Burroughs to satisfy his desires. At some point, Marker likely began to refuse to uphold his end of the bargain because he wasn't really as into Burroughs as Burroughs was into him. Their relationship and their anthropological adventure ended unsuccessfully, and they returned to Mexico City on September 3, 1951. 
On the night of September 6, 1951, the couple was drinking with friends in an apartment above the Bounty Bar in Mexico City. As is usually the case when alcohol and most likely drugs are involved, there's no one version of events. Some friends noted that Balmer and Burroughs had a William Tell routine that they'd seen the couple perform at parties at their home in Texas. Others stated that there was no routine and they'd never seen the couple do anything like that before. No one can confirm whether or not Balmer willingly put a glass atop her head or if Burroughs coaxed her into doing so. What is certain is after months of incidents involving a drunk Burroughs having firearms taken away from him by friends and authorities, he once again was inebriated and holding a gun in his hands. The whole ordeal is shrouded in mystery, lies, and conflicting stories. At least once, Burroughs stated that the gun went off accidentally when he was showing it to a friend who was interested in buying it. Another time, he admitted to aiming the 38 caliber pistol at a drinking glass on top of his wife's head. Either way, he pulled the trigger and missed, killing the 28-year-old mother of two with a single shot to her forehead. Burroughs spent a total of 13 days in a Mexican jail before his brother Mortimer came and bribed Mexican lawyers and officials to release him. The killing was ruled a culpable homicide by Mexican authorities, and Burroughs awaited trial while still out on bail and under the supervision and guidance of a prominent Mexican attorney. Two witnesses agreed to testify that the gun had gone off accidentally while he was checking to see if it was loaded, and the ballistics ex experts were bribed to support this story. In all, it is believed that the Burroughs family handed over a total of $20,000 in bribes. Unfortunately for Burroughs, his attorney, Bernabe Jurado, got into trouble himself and fled the country before Burroughs' trial. Burroughs decided to flee back to the United States, where he was also wanted in connection with a drug bust in Louisiana. He was convicted in absentia, of homicide and was given a two-year sentence, which was suspended. Still, Burroughs was in trouble with the law in the U.S. and Mexico, and his friends were grieving Vollmer's death. Feeling alone and unwanted, Burroughs left for Tangier, Morocco, where, by his own account, quote, I lived in, a one, in one room in the native quarter of Tangier. I had not taken a bath in a year, nor changed my clothes or removed them, except to stick a needle every hour in the fibrous gray wooden flesh of terminal addiction. I did absolutely nothing. I could look at the end of my shoe for eight hours. Burroughs remained in Morocco until 1958, receiving periodic visits from Allen Ginsberg and a longer visit from his son, Billy Burroughs. Following his mother's death, Billy lived with his grandparents in Missouri and Florida. Like his father, Billy was susceptible to drug addiction and quickly became hooked on methadrine while living with his father in Tangier around 1961. Ten years later, his liver collapsed, which led to a transplant, but his body rejected the transplanted organ and he died in 1981. Balmer's daughter, Julie, did not appear to have had much contact with Burroughs following her mother's death. Eventually, she married and had three children. Until his death, Burroughs never really talked about the incident, but there were rumors that he had filed for divorce just prior to shooting Balmer, and that they had been fighting over custody of their son. Others stated that Burroughs may have intentionally shot Vollmer after getting annoyed by her jealousy when it came to his gay lovers, but none of this was ever confirmed. The couple was never actually legally married. Vollmer was aware that Burroughs was gay, and she chose to stay with him anyway. But, of course, we'll never know Vollmer's side of the story. While Burroughs claimed that he never intended to be a writer, he appears to have processed the shooting through his writing. However, 
he remained very much dependent on his friends to help him organize his disjointed pages into formal books. During two separate visits with Burroughs in Morocco, Ginsburg edited the pages that became the book Junkie, and Kerouac picked pages of his writing up off the floor, which were eventually combined to become his most famous book, Naked Lunch. In sobriety, he also depended on those around him to cook and clean for him so he could focus on writing. Surprisingly, he remained an avid gun fanatic and was frequently photographed with his various firearms. It would be irresponsible of me to omit the obvious white privilege from which this group benefited, especially considering that Amiri Baraka once was a part of this group. Researching Burroughs gave me some insight into why Baraka distanced himself from this group and ultimately divorced his wife and declared himself a black nationalist. I'd heard stories in the past about Baraka's internal conflict with his decision to divorce his wife, but this story really put things into perspective. What's important to understand is that a black person cannot separate themselves from their race or from the struggles that they endure or the institutions which they seek to dismantle. There is no world in which Baraka could exist as a junkie poet who killed his white wife, was repeatedly bailed out by his wealthy parents, and went on to become a well-respected member of a, an entire literary movement. Black people, and especially black men, in America, simply don't have that luxury. Thank you for joining me today in the professor's kitchen for this dinner crime video on William S. Burroughs. If you enjoyed the story or watching me make this absolutely disgusting dish, it was garbage, literally. I took one bite, nearly puked, and threw it in the garbage. <laughs> it was horrible. If you liked it though, if you liked watching it, <laughs> please feel free to share it with a friend, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. And again, warning, if you try this dish, then I apologize in advance because it was, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. It was, and if you ever want to name a dish after me, then please make sure that it tastes good because this one did not. And I would not like to have my name associated with a disgusting dish. Please and thank you. Ciao for now. Okay, so I need to document this. I'm making this egg dish for the first time for the new video on my YouTube channel and it looks like who done it and what for. I am genuinely concerned about eating this um, but I'm gonna try it just for the sake of science or whatever I don't know okay here we go so this is what it looks like it just it looks like pasta excuse me mm -mm. nope